Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. So we're working through chromatography, and this is the first lecture of the last week. And really the goal of this week is going to be to introduce you to liquid chromatography. So we're going to be talking about the instrumentation, column selection, and the various issues that come up when you try to optimize a liquid chromatographic separation. But first, what I want to do is take you through your case study. So case study two is all about chocolate. And the purpose of this case study is different than the last one. My hope is to get you to really engage with reading methodology about chromatography. I think one of the tests that you've learned something is to be able to look at a fairly technical article about chromatography and to understand a lot of the terminology as well as some of the decisions they may have made and how they choose to operate. So that's really going to be our goal. So as where, whereas the last case study was a little bit more about the choice of instrument, this case study is going to be a, much more about within that choice of instrument, in this case gas and liquid chromatography, what are the specific parameters that were selected and why. So let me give you some sense of your case. So you're going to be working in a commercial analytical laboratory a mythical one, of course, called Food Stuff. It's a small business, but it's been growing because of the demand from the food and beverage industry for testing. So these days, if you sell food or beverages to the public, you have a lot of regulations you have to meet. Some of them have to do with food safety. Others have to do with, for example, putting out a really good product. So small commercial analytical laboratories are actually kind of an interesting and growing business. It's associated with the foodie community. In your case, you're an analyst who specializes in chromatography. And the kinds of instruments you have available to you, I'm giving you some of the details, although I don't think it's going to be too, too important in the case, but in case you wanted it, you've got some gas chromatographs coupled with mass spectrometers. And you also have sort of conventional HPLCs, several of them. Your issue in this case isn't going to be throughput. But why you're thinking about chocolate, if you're an analyst in this situation, is because your boss has realized it's a new and up and coming market. So chocolate is a very interesting food product because it's one that has long been associated with luxury. And I would encourage you to look at some of the review articles I provide on chocolate, but it's a substance that really has a very rich lore. It's linked to romance, it's also linked to wealth. And in the ancient times, chocolate was actually considered to be a very powerful medicinal agent. In any case, what has happened is a lot of high-end chocolatiers are opening up shops trying to make beautiful and very fancy chocolates that people will pay a lot for. And in fact, if you look at this graph here, you can see that as time has gone on, people are getting more and more willing to pay for high-end chocolate. And the growth in this industry in the U.S. alone has been pretty phenomenal. And hopefully your company will be able to capture some of that market because often people who are really producing luxury food products like to have information, scientific information about their products. And so for example, if you read the case study, you've been approached by a high-end chocolatier, somebody who, as we'll talk about in a moment, takes chocolate and fashions it into beautiful candies to help him understand what is his chocolate and how might he market it more effectively to his customers. So a little bit about the production of chocolate. There's a review article I provide you that's just optional reading, but it sort of goes over some of the basics. So chocolate actually comes from a cocoa tree and the fruit is what you see over here. It's these sort of pink melon type things. If you cut them open, inside the fruit are seeds and those are the cocoa seeds. And what you do is you roast those seeds. You first ferment the seeds and then you roast them. And then you crack them out of it and you get basically cocoa beans, roasted cocoa beans as shown here under the fruit. Then what you do is you take those beans, you press them together and you create a cocoa liqueur, which you can mix with cocoa butter, which is a fat product from the same process. And you can mix it with sugar and milk and other items to create kind of the chocolate. So the cocoa nib liqueur goes into the chocolate and in fact is responsible for all of the flavors we think of when we think of chocolate. Um, then the chocolatier actually gets something different than all of that. He gets a bar of chocolate. So just to go over what happens, you pick the fruit, you ferment it, that's important. Often that happens in the sun. You shell and you roast it and you take the nibs to make chocolate liqueur. Now what happens then is somebody who's selling chocolate, let's say in the city of Houston, is going to be buying big bars of basically conched chocolate or chocolate that's really already been mixed with milk and sugar and gone through this full process. So nobody roasts their own cocoa beans, usually on a small scale. 
And this conch chocolate is sort of the raw product that they then fashion into whatever chocolates they're making. And they often can buy those bars in very large quantities from a variety of different sources. And here's some really good um, citations you might want to go look at if you want to just learn more about the production of chocolate. So just to be clear, a chocolate maker is somebody who goes from the cocoa fruit all the way to a conch chocolate bar, whereas a chocolatier is somebody who takes that bar and then turns it into really amazing candies. So the first thing that your customer is interested in is actually something called polyaromatic hydrocarbons. So one of the interesting things about the chocolate industry is that the high-end growth of chocolate has actually been driven by health concerns. So there's a lot of uh, interest in red wine, in tea, and in chocolate for the fact that they may carry flavonoids that are actually antioxidants. We'll talk about those in a moment. But there's also concerns about some of the chemicals that might be in chocolate that maybe aren't so good for us. And one of those classes of chemicals are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, also known as PAHs. There are classes of molecules, and I'll show you a couple of examples here to the left, that are very large, they're aromatic, and they generally develop when food is roasted or, for example, grilled. So the PAH content of food when it's roasted or grilled increases substantially. And PAHs, of course, have a variety of different effects in a variety of different settings that's beyond the scope of this class, but nevertheless, people would like to know how many PAHs might be present in things that they're consuming. So that's one of the questions. So one of the issues is how do you measure PAHs in chocolate? And so polyaromatic hydrocarbons are kind of a challenge for gas chromatography, but the one method I could find that I could provide to you for free is an example of a gas chromatographic method for measuring exactly that polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And the point of providing you the method, just to give you a GC method, is also to have you recognize some of the challenges of working with really high molecular weight compounds in the GC. And these are not just high molecular weight, they're also high boiling point, uh, both of which lead to the problem of column contamination. I also give you an HPLC method, that's going to be the topic of this week, high performance or high pressure liquid chromatography, that you'll see be able to compare and contrast a GC method and an HPLC method for measuring these polyaromatics. Predominantly people are not so much interested in exactly what kind of polyaromatic you have, they kind of want to know the total content in a sample. So, so another thing that I've asked you to think about that's also a gas chromatographic question is authentication. So interestingly enough, authentication is one of the hottest areas of food analysis. And that's because if you're buying really expensive chocolate bars, you want to make sure that those chocolate bars are sourced with the finest cocoa you can find. And it turns out that the Criollo beans, predominantly from South America, are considered to be some of the very best chocolate you can buy in the world. Other types of beans are not considered quite as special. So really, really gourmet, Chocolatiers are going to want Criollo, but it's kind of hard to know when you buy the bars exactly what you have. Or maybe, because Criollo is so much more expensive, your supplier cut and added some of the cheaper chocolate to some of the more expensive chocolate. And this is a common issue. It's common in a lot of sort of expensive foodstuffs, the concern that maybe the raw material you're buying isn't as pure or isn't made from the expensive ingredients you would expect. So people are always looking for ways to fingerprint the food that they're purchasing. And the examples I give you this week, and I gave you one from coffee and one from whiskey, are two examples of using headspace gas chromatography to look at the volatiles that come out. And over here to the left, which you can see, is a GC analysis of a counterfeit scotch whiskey. And what you're doing in an authentication experiment is you're looking specifically for signatures that only occur in the real product and not in the fake product. So in this case, if you look at the brief reading, what you'll find is one of the interesting differences between fake whiskey and real whiskey is actually the ratio of n-propanol to, to butanol. And that is a great, what's called descriptor for real whiskey. So if you were to authenticate Criollo co cocoa beans, you need to find what's a particular chemical that would only be present in Criollo and not in some of the others. And could you detect it with the GC methodology? Another interesting example 
is actually another ratio of some alcohols that are present. So a lot of this sort of looking for ways to authenticate something based on these very complex GCMS profiles is really a game of pattern recognition. This is an extra credit part of what you're doing, so you don't have to go and read about the authentication and the GCMS fingerprinting, but it's a pretty fascinating area, and you're going to have to put together some pieces if you want to propose a reasonable way to authenticate that the chocolatier is actually buying the expensive Criollo, Criollo chocolate. Now we're going to move into liquid chromatography. So chocolate's also kind of known now for being a positive thing to consume, particularly dark chocolate. And one of the reasons for that are the antioxidants that are present in chocolate. They're known as catechins. And catechins are pretty fascinating molecules. Here's some examples shown over here. Uh, they're basically molecules that can have different, is different isomers. And I'm going to just point out here, both at this carbon and this carbon, you can have either the sort of phenyl group pointing down and the hydroxyl pointing up, or you can have them both pointing up. So remember, at these two centers, you have hydrogens. And so if the hydrogens are pointing in different directions, one above and one below, then that's one kind of structure versus if they're both pointing up. So over here in this sort of sideways example, looking edge on to this molecule, you can see these two whites are the hydrogens. And in this case, it's a catechin because one, the hydrogen's pointing up, here it's pointing down, whereas an epicatechin, they would both be pointing up or down. So in any case, I won't go into the naming of these particular class of molecules, but catechins and epicatechins are very important flavonoids that can actually or have been associated with antioxidant and sort of protective abilities, particularly against aging. Now, interestingly enough, the concentrations of these diminish with roasting. So a lot of whether or not you still have a lot of catechins in the chocolate will depend a lot on some of the details of how you roasted the beans, particularly the temperature and how long. So in the, in the example that I give you in your reading, it's an open source paper, which is why I was able to select it. And it's very interesting because it talks about a quantitative methodology for using HPLC to really classify what kinds of catechins you have. So in this chromatogram here, you can see both catechin and epicatechin, and you can quantify how much you have by the integration of the peak areas under the HPLC data sets. And as you read this paper, you're going to get a lot of information about the kinds of variables you need to be really careful with if you're going to replicate this experiment experiment in a laboratory setting. Another molecule, class of molecules I couldn't resist looking at in chocolate were xanthines. So xanthines are alkaloids and they encompass for some very familiar molecules like caffeine, um, but they also have some unfamiliar ones like theobromine. And it was interesting is theobromine doesn't have any bromine in it. It's just sort of an old-fashioned name for a molecule that's actually a close cousin of caffeine, if you look over here at the structures. So you also have some methodologies for quantifying and characterizing the alkaloids present in chocolate. And both theobromine and caffeine are powerful um, neurological agents. Of course, caffeine's a stimulate. Theobromine's considered to be something that can make you very calm and happy related to how we process serotonin. So both of those are kind of interesting to know, and they also are very sensitive to how the beans, both the type of bean you start with, how you fermented it, and ultimately how you roasted it. So different types of chocolate produced in different ways could have very different types of xanthines as well as quantitative, quantitative levels of these molecules. So the methodology that I'm giving you is an interesting one because it really takes you through the choices related to the liquid chromatography column, the topics of this week's lecture. So really, your task is going to be to design methods for both GC and HPLC analysis of chocolate. And I've given you some starting materials, but you should feel free to be wide ranging in the World Wide Web and see if you can find any additional reading materials. Um, you'll have two options for this case study. You can go ahead and do the peer grading like we did in the first case study, which some of you liked, some of you didn't like. Or you can elect to take a quiz, which will be worth the same number of points, in which I ask you some pretty deep questions about the reading. And I'll probably give you two tries on that quiz. Both of these are going to be up in within the next four or five days for you to start to look at. If you want to do both, I'll go ahead and allow that, but I'll probably only give you extra points up to about 10 points for the extra thing you did. In any case, I encourage you to do the reading and to think about this case study however you wish to be assessed, because the case studies are really where you make some practical connections and begin to synthesize a lot of the knowledge that you're getting that's more sort of rote knowledge about this, these instruments. So in any case, I hope you enjoy reading all about chocolate and learning about what the chemistry of chocolate is like 
and how you might actually begin to analyze it. Thanks so much and see you next time.